Hi, I'm Dave Cliff, the Chief Executive of the Global Road Safety Partnership. Um, my background to speak to you today on the enforcement of speed is I'm an, a, for, a former Assistant Commissioner of Police based here in New Zealand. And we currently advise policing agencies right across the globe, across Africa, Asia, Latin America and parts of Europe on best practice enforcement. So the presentation today, I'm going to take you through what the fundamental principles are, what makes enforcement most effective, and then end with a conclusion on the sorts of things that really do make a difference to the composition of the enforcement programme. So if you wrap up all the evidence about speeding, and I know there's going to be a separate presentation on that aspect, if we reduce speeds by just 5%, this leads to approximately a 10% decrease in injury crashes and a 20% decrease in fatal crashes. Or another way of looking at it, one kilometre an hour reduction in mean speeds equals about a 4% reduction in road fatalities. So these very small changes in speed have a very significant impact on your trauma rates. One important aspect to think about when we're talking about enforcement is how much is enough. So we use the health analogy of dosage. So by comparing New South Wales with some of the best performing European countries, so for example the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium and France, we can see that the volume of enforcement activity in New South Wales is significantly lower than the best performing European countries. So there's a great opportunity there to increase the level of enforcement and achieve the benefits of that. The evidence around this is also very clear very positive relationship between the amount of enforcement that occurs and the effects on crashes. The more enforcement, the larger the crash reduction impact. So when we think about effective enforcement, we think about deterrence, which is what will cause drivers to behave in safer ways, so reduce speeds or reduce drink driving, wear safety belts, etc. So we think about it in two ways. One, general deterrence which is the perceived risk of enforcement. So it's about the threat of enforcement, if you like. So people can see it, hear it on the radio, be told about it. That's general deterrence. Specific deterrence is actually catching people and penalising them. So it can be an infringement or a prosecution for more serious offences. Now what the evidence says here is that people are less affected in the speeding area by general deterrence as, as opposed to specific deterrence. So it's not so much the threat, it's actually catching them. And what we also know is that this is based in part on the fact that speeding behaviour is complex. People are constantly adjusting their speed for corners, traffic volumes, whether they think they'll be caught, how quickly they need to travel to get to the new place, the next place they're moving to. So they're constantly adjusting speed and the, the sort of research that we see says that when people see a police officer with a speed detection device or they see a speed camera, they slow down. After passing, they speed up. In fact, they go faster uh, than they were before they saw the uh, police activity. So you need a balance between this idea of seeing enforcement and also catching people. So the two are complementary and both need to be thought about in terms of effective uh, deterrence for speeding. There are essentially two uh, primary types of enforcement. There's automated enforcement, which can occur through things like fixed speed cameras, mobile speed cameras, uh, those mounted in vehicles, and point-to-point -point systems, which measure, which measure time over distance, and uh, enforcement carried out by police officers. So the research on this is also quite clear that hidden mobile cameras spread over ha have an effect that's over much broader areas because people can't predict exactly where the enforcement's going to occur. They're forced to slow down everywhere. So the crash reduction impacts of that are greater. We do know that visible cameras are very effective at slowing people at specific black spots. So if there's an area of high risk and we, in, we insert a fixed camera to slow people down at that particular point, there's an advantage in using a, a visible camera at that location. Hidden cameras also have the advantage of reducing this kangaroo effect, which is slowing down for the camera and then speeding up afterwards. So that's also a benefit of having less conspicuous cameras. We can also say that there, is, there, is, there are good and effective systems and there are less effective systems in terms of cost and benefit. 
So some analysis of the system in Sweden as compared with the state of Victoria showed that while they, while they achieved similar results, the Swedish um, approach was about three times the cost to implement as opposed to Victoria. And Victoria also had more potential identified. So it's not just the system, it's also how it's applied. And we also know again from um, research by the European Commission that overt cameras are less optimal than covert cameras. Now the mix in Europe is, uh, some are well signed and some are inconspicuous, really well signed. You need a, a huge number of them to create the same effect. Less conspicuous cameras, less are required because again people are forced to slow down everywhere which is really the effect that we want. And the picture there shows how they're used in Switzerland. Their cameras are everywhere, they are grey, difficult to see not signed and do have that general suppression right across the network. And another important consideration is that if crashes just happen in particular places that would be great but that's simply not the case. About half of the fatal and serious crashes that occur happen in locations where there's never been one before. That's why you want to slow down the population everywhere not just in these traditionally high crash rate areas. The impact of public awareness campaigns, so this is television, radio, social media, billboards on advertising and highlighting uh, enforcement action and the importance of it, greatly enhances the impact. So this ongoing campaign that's constantly looking at who the offending groups are, looking at the profile of those who are being injured and killed in speed related crashes, and then keeping this issue at the forefront of drivers has been shown time and time again to enhance enforcement. So we know enforcement is effective. We know that public awareness campaigns on their own are not that influential, but when you put the two together, they have a powerful impact. Another important consideration is just the way in which police officers frame conversations to the media when they talk about speed. It's about showing uh, aberrant speeding as an outlier not something that's common. So if someone's commenting from police about a speed operation saying they checked the speeds of you know, eight or 900 uh, drivers and only five were found to be speeding is a very good message as opposed to talking about just the highest speed and people will tend to say, well, I wouldn't do that speed and therefore my low level speeding is safe, which it isn't. So police can also be trained to help in this area. I think there's often a belief that speed enforcement is not popular, it's often referred to as revenue raising or um, not important and it's seen as victimless. But in fact when you actually survey the population, and here's some examples here from both Europe, uh, New Zealand and the UK, that when you actually ask people questions about enforcement, it's positive. 76% um, of drivers in the EU favour increased traffic enforcement, 66% um, very much or fairly f or, or favour automated speed um, cameras and so on. So the, there are definitely a vocal minority who are opposed and don't like speeding and can't get their heads around it, but when you actually survey populations, and this is right around the globe, most people get the relationship between speed, crash risk and death because it really is common sense. So don't be dissuaded by that vocal minority because they are not representative of, of the view of the great majority. There are some fundamental components to what a, an effective road policing program looks like. So it needs to be strategic and targeted. It's about being based on crash data and other intelligence about where speeding is occurring. It needs to be um, part of a broad road safety strategy and it's got to be well supported. It's got to be delivered by police who understand the implications of what they're doing, supported by a comprehensive offender management program, so things like demerit points, ensuring that people pay fines when, that they, um, when they receive them, that high level penalty offending results in loss of licence and then those other penalties. So those things have to support an effective program. Also it needs to involve strong partnerships between police and other agencies, so for example if there's a problem in a particular community or problem with speeding around a school, p police need to be able to demonstrate they're responsive to that through their program. It's got to be sufficiently funded and it does need clear and ambitious targets, un unambiguous targets. So for example, um, 
putting in place performance measures for police to reduce speeding by defined amount, uh, independently measured over a particular period, is a good way of holding police accountable for delivering speed reduction over time. There also needs to be a balanced approach in enforcement between the use of automated enforcement, as we discussed, and then officer-based enforcement. Both can be complementary. And another important consideration is a minimal level of tolerance. This comes through loud and clear in terms of the advice from the uh, European Union that you want police enforcing speeds as close as possible to the speed limit because the greater the tolerance, the higher people the higher the speed people will travel. And that creates a de facto speed limit. And as we've seen, small increases in speed, large increases in trauma. So if the speed limit on a rural road is 70 or 80 kilometres an hour, you want police enforcing as close as possible to that limit and not allowing people's speed to creep up because that is directly uh, contradicting the, the crash prevention um, approach that we want to achieve. So what makes enforcement effective? Well, Firstly, we talked initially about dosage, so there needs to be enough of it. And in the case of New South Wales, there's clearly scope to increase the level of enforcement. Again, going to the research, there's clear evidence that shows a doubling of enforcement effort creates powerful crash reduction. So that can be used as, as one um, approach. And it really doesn't matter from the start point. So while New South Wales enforcement at the moment is comparatively low, in comparison with other Australian states and the EU, a doubling of that will be noticeable um, to drivers and will create a positive impact. It needs to be unpredictable, but regular. If people can guess where the patrol is going to be, guess where the speed camera is going to be positioned, roughly know what time police will be working, that is, will not be an effective campaign. You want people to slow down everywhere and all the time because they simply can't guess where police are going to be. So the way police are deployed is, a, is very important. Sanctions need to be swift and penalties need to be sit, set at a point where they, are, they provide deterrence. So they can't be too low and they can't be too high and you'll have a sense of what will work there. And enforcement needs to be network wide. So nowhere within your network shouldn't be um, subject to enforcement, but it needs to be focused on those higher crash risk areas. So again, deploying police at times and locations of greatest risk um, provides the greatest benefit. So now just talking for a minute about uh, setting and speed enforcement targets. So it's about ensuring that all these things are being monitored. Is there network-wide coverage? Is patrolling planned and targeted so that the whole network is receiving coverage proportional to the risk? Are we seeing reductions in mean and 85th percentile travel speed so we can see the whole population slowing down. It's a very important measure because ultimately these small reductions in speed are what you want to see over time and if police are deploying and enforcing effectively that's exactly what you'll be seeing. And another very good performance measure is to work out for officer enforcement in particular whether the level of activity that's occurring is consistent with the known levels of offending. If police in a particular area are identifying very few offences, but you know objectively through the surveys that there are high rates of offending, then that becomes a performance issue that police uh, leadership needs to deal with. So just summarising some of these things, if we think about road policing this way, it's got to be intensive, it has to be sustained over time, it's got to be as random as possible so people can't guess where the enforcement is going to occur but know it's regular, should be utilising both highly visible operations, general deterrence, targeted covert operations to catch those who are habitually speeding, which is the uh, specific deterrence, and by doing that, reduce punishment avoidance. The idea is that people who are habitually speeding need to be habitually caught, and the penalties ideally will graduate, so if repeated offending results in higher and more significant penalties. It's gotta be well supported by a mass media campaign, and really that is the warning. We, we don't want police involved in warning individuals when you're hopefully be running a multi-million dollar campaign that's providing ongoing warnings to the population about the impacts of speeding and how their behaviour can help reduce the state's trauma levels. The last thing to talk about is just, again, optimising effectiveness uh, through, through research. The, the, the best enforcement systems we've seen are often tied up 
very closely linked to universities. So you've got some great options there across Australia between uh, the University of South Australia, MUARC is just two examples. So we're constantly testing the enforcement approach, um, having researchers analysing to see the impacts on crash reduction, um, adjusting enforcement accordingly in terms of um, random, unpredictable time, location, can really start to maximise the effect. But in, in closing, there are definitely lessons to be learnt and more effective ways of conducting enforcement or less, or less effective if, if um, the evidence isn't followed in terms of the approach. If you would like to get in touch, please feel free and the contact details for the Global Road Safety Partnership are here uh, in the final slide. Thank you.